She's an older cat with some more serious chronic health problems. This is Dr. Andrew Jones. In this video, I'm going to discuss some of the current problems with our dogs and cats. Plus, what I see is the three main causes behind these problems. Big Pharma, Pet Food, and Vaccines. During my 17 years of veterinary practice, in which I treated or examined over 30,000 dogs and cats, it was not unusual for me to see some very young pets with serious health disorders. Five-year-old dogs being diagnosed with illnesses such as bone and limb cancer, autoimmune disease, chronic skin allergies, degenerative arthritis, urinary tract infections, and chronic gastrointestinal disease. Or young seven-year-old cats being diagnosed with vaccine-induced sarcoma, diabetes, feline lower urinary tract disease, asthma, pancreatitis, chronic vomiting, and diarrhea. Canine cancer affects one out of every three dogs. Of those, over half of them will die of cancer. There are 80 million dogs in the United States. Of those, 27 million will be diagnosed with cancer. And of those, 14 million will die of cancer. Golden Retrievers have the highest incidence of cancer amongst all dog breeds. Hemangiosarcoma and lymphosarcoma are the most commonly diagnosed serious types of cancer. The breed's average lifespan is now down to 10 and a half years and 60% of all golden retrievers will die of cancer. Why is this happening? One of the facts of American life these days is that many prescription drugs are now household names. Both doctors and the public want to reach for the newest prescription drug. You can't sit down to TV at night and not see a half a dozen drug company commercials. Millions of Americans watch the ads and then ask their doctors for prescriptions. The reason we're seeing so much consumer advertising is because it works. They do it by telling people, ask your doctor. They can sell us almost anything. These large pharmaceutical companies now have a profound influence, not only on your pet, but more importantly, on your vet. You know, I speak from personal experience. For being a practicing veterinarian for nearly 20 years, you know, I experienced their direct influence. Consider the flea and tick medication, Convortis and Triflexis. The FDA's recorded over 340 dog deaths associated with the flea and tick medication, Convortis and Triflexis. The FDA adverse drug reports in Spinosad, that's the active ingredient in Comfortis and Triflexis, has shown over 400 different adverse drug experiences in dogs and that over 10,000 dog owners have reported side effects. Here are just some of the effects. Um, in this first table, it's showing over 200 dogs have been reported have died from it. And in this second table here, it's shown that over nearly 120 dogs have been euthanized as a result of being exposed to Spinosad. I'm saying using this conventional med medication with caution. I'm not advocating eliminating of it, but I'm suggesting just be cautious. Here's some points I want you to keep in mind. One, choose a veterinarian open to alternative veterinary medicine. When possible, consider using a holistic modality to treat your pet as opposed to using one of the conventional drugs. Educate yourself on the basics of treating your pet at home with safe natural remedies. If your dog or cat is to be treated with a conventional medication, ask your veterinarian a lot of questions. Ask about the incidence of side effects and about alternate options. And if you're using conventional medication, Try and use the lowest possible dose and avoid giving it long term. Pet food makers want us to treat Fido and Fifi like members of the family. They say our furry friends get choice cuts of meat, fish and poultry. But behind the glossy ads, it's a different story. Unfortunately, the pet food industry is not being forthcoming with pet owners. It's more than a quibble with kibble. Are we poisoning our pets? 
Now, pet owners are wondering, is the food a quality product? Is the industry adequately regulated? Can the industry still be trusted? Critics say no. The recent recall was an accident waiting to happen. And the problem goes on. 18 months from now, we'll have another recall if we don't do something about it. Standards can be lax. Old boots, wood shavings, and motor oil. Add some vitamins and minerals, and this brew could actually meet the minimum standards for dog food. Now, an investigation of this $16 billion industry reveals quite a mess. Looks like pet food has become a dog's breakfast. The problems documented in that last clip about pet food are very real and should be a big concern to you. Nutrition is the key to the health of our pets. Imagine shopping in a grocery store. You've got the inside aisles, which are the junk, the dry goods, versus the outside aisles with fresh fruit, vegetables, milk, meat. You know, our pets, they're no different. Yet most dogs and cats are exclusively fed from the inside aisles. They're fed this dry, unvaried, non-nutritious kibble. You know, feeding a natural, varied, healthy diet is one of, if not the most important change you can make as a pet owner for the long-term health of your pet. Commercial kibble is often composed of grains, corn, wheat, fat, byproducts, fillers, artificial colors, artificial flavors, artificial preservatives, and in some cases, contaminants and toxins. The pet food industry itself is an extension of the human food and agriculture industries. You know, pet food provides a market for animal fat, grains considered unfit for human consumption, and similar waste products turn into profit. Think of intestines, udders, you know, fish heads, the scales, possibly disease and cancerous animal parts. Ingredients to always avoid. Avoid chemical preservatives such as ethoxyquin, BHA, BHT, propylene glycol, and sodium nitrite. Instead, look for natural preservatives, such as tocipherols, vitamin E, and ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Avoid foods with artificial flavor enhancers, such as phosphoric acid. Clearly, there's no need for artificial flavor. Avoid art artificial colors. And these include a variety of these bright, vivid colors. According to Wikipedia, some of these artificial colors have been found to be mutagenic. Other case studies have linked these artificial colors with basal cell carcinoma, cancer. Focus on the top five ingredients. These five ingredients comprise 70% or more of a dry pet food's entire formula. And by focusing on these, you can determine if that food is of a good quality. Typically, the first ingredient is most important, but this change is based on the moisture content. In terms of comparing, you've got to make sure you're comparing dry food to dry food, not dry food to canned food. The form of the protein in terms of chicken meal is a good quality protein versus meat meal, which is a very poor quality protein. And the real percentage of that ingredient in the food in terms of it may look as if you've got a protein as the first ingredient, whereas you might have corn and wheat uh, as a carbohydrate thrown in there. So when you add in those two carbohydrates together, they actually are the primary ingredient. I want to give you a couple recipes here. The first one here is the dog fish and sweet potato recipe based on a 75 pound dog. Four cups of baked sweet potato, one and a half cups of cooked fish, I'm suggesting trout. Plus you can add one and a half scoops of my supplement, Ultimate Canine Health Formula, or five teaspoons of fish oil, two tablets of a one a day multivitamin mineral supplement, two, two and a half caplets of a posture caplet that gives provides elemental calcium, plus one, one teaspoon of Morton Lysol salt mixture. And this is the basic cat recipe. One pound of bo one fresh boneless skinless chicken breasts, one tablespoon of fish oil, plus one scoop of my supplement, ult ultimate feline health formula, or one quarter of a teaspoon of Martin's light salt, a quarter of a teaspoon of iodated salt, three grams of calcium carbonate without vitamin D, regular Tums, one tablet, of an adult multivitamin mineral supplement, and a quarter of a teaspoon of taurine powder.
to your pet. You love them and want to do everything to keep them healthy and safe. For many pet owners, that means yearly vaccinations. But could you be putting them at risk by vaccinating them too often? Our Jackie Calloway has an eye-opening look tonight at your pet, your vet, and vaccinations. He was just such a gentle giant. Gloria Noakes' beloved dog, Tig, died at just six years old. You kind of just trust your, your vet. Especially when it came to annual vaccines. The vet would send us a notice in the mail and, you know, it's time for your yearly vaccines and we would comply. The last vaccines were given when the vet looked at Tig for a sore on his back. Exactly 72 hours later is when Tig's body was completely broken out with these sores. Turns out it was cancer. He died soon after. No doubt in my mind that those vaccines uh, accelerated his illness. Any veterinarian my age has killed a dog or a cat from vaccines. Vaccines have a variety of risks that you really need to be aware of. This is what renowned immunologist Dr. Ronald Schultz has to say. You know, annual revaccination provides no benefit and may increase the risk for adverse reactions. The percentage of vaccinated animals protected from clinical disease after challenge with the two main dog vaccines, canine distemper virus, canine parvovirus, and canine adenovirus in one study, was greater than 95%. In terms of what he's saying is, you know, that, that one vaccine itself is providing the immunity that you need, not this continual yearly reboosters. There's a variety of side effects of vaccines. There's short-term ones, which can include anaphylaxis, that is the allergic reaction such as itching, vomiting, diarrhea, facial swelling, weakness, difficulty breathing, shock, and in some cases death. Local reactions, in the swelling at the injection site, abscess pain, and then generalized systemic reactions throughout your pet's body, fever, loss of appetite, weakness. Then there is a host of immune mediated and long-term diseases. They can include immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, immune-mediated skin disease, thyroid disease, vaccine-induced skin cancer, particularly in cats, as you can see in this picture here, skin allergies, arthritis, leukemia, inflammatory or bowel disease, and neurologic conditions, just to name a few. The incidence of vaccine side effects appears minimal for most dogs and cats, so they're given a reduced number of vaccines as infrequently as possible, uh, such as on this new reduced vaccine regimen, which I'm going to discuss right after this. If more veterinarians would be willing to comply with these new guidelines, we likely would have far less dogs and cats with vaccine side effects. So this is sort of my particular modified um, advised vaccine regimen. Puppies should only be vaccinated for parvovirus, that's a modified live vaccine, and distemper virus. Only give Bordetella vaccine if you're going to a kennel or puppy class. Give the rabies vaccine at six months. Kittens should only be vaccinated for the respiratory viruses, that's FERCP, feline viral rhinal tracheitis, calice virus, and panleukopenia. Feline leukemia vaccine should only be given to high-risk cats. There's very few numbers would qualify for this. Those in multi-cat households or outdoor cats surrounded by large cat populations. If giving the rabies vaccine, wait to give it until six months of age. Ensure that the vaccines are given in the sub-Q tissue and the lateral sides of the right and left lower legs. My current advice is to have your dog or cat titer tested at one year of age, seeing if they have protective immunity. If so, they're not going to need any additional vaccines. If they're not protective, then give them the, the, those yearly boosters. Following that, your pet may not need another vaccine, um, but you can go ahead and have another titer test in three years of age. Um, some vaccine regimens are advising booster vaccines every three years, but in my experience, this is most likely not necessarily and probably over vaccinating. I wanted to mention a couple of homeopathic treatments which may help minimize the chance of a vaccine reaction after vaccination. One, so after the vaccine, give a dose of Thuya 30C. You can give one capsule um, for a cat and dose that for one pet, one capsule per 20 pounds. So accordingly for your dog's weight. Wait a week, then after that, give a dose of sulfur 
6x once daily for 7 days. Thank you for watching this video. I do feel that if you make some of the changes I suggest in relating to what type of food you're feeding your dog or cat, minimizing the use of conventional medication, being very judicious among the use of canine and feline vaccines, you really can avoid many of those problems I just discussed. Then stay tuned for the next video in that I'm going to discuss many of the more common dog and cat diseases plus specific safe, natural, and effective at-home remedies that you can be using.